just to take a few minutes to welcome everybody for taking the time out of your day to um, come to this webinar. And my hope is that it will be useful for you. And just first off, a shout out to all those of you who are, you know, working, who are um, essential workers, who are working in healthcare, who are caring for others, whether they're physical or mental health, whether you're caregivers for elderly folks working in residential care. Thank you. We see you. We know how hard this is. For those of you who are home and may not have the resources to care for your families, we know and we are aware of that as well. And um, we know that ha this is really, really hard for all of us. Um, for those of us who are lucky enough to have work and be at home with our kids, that is hard also. And that's going to actually be um, one of the topics of our conversation today. So just to take a minute to kind of settle in um, and we'll have a chat. So this is a little strange because usually I have Jen with me, who you may have met if you have seen the previous webinars, and she wasn't able to come today. So I'll be kind of doing this myself. So forgive me in advance if I'm a, a little clunky in kind of going through. Jen has sent me a series of really wonderful questions for the community. Um, and the topic of our discussion today is parental burnout. And yes, it is a thing. So we'll get going on that. So I guess the first question that um, you all sent was, what is it? What is parental burnout? Are there telltale signs? And are the symptoms similar across all parents or do they differ on household role? So. You know, it's funny because it sounds like this would have been something, you know, this idea that parents can get burned out. You would think that this has been around for a really long time, but the fact of the matter is it actually is quite a new idea, right? And it came about um, in 2014 when a group of researchers who were looking into job burnout, right, thought, well, is burnout something that is restricted to one's work? And basically they said, no, they did not think so. And they thought that anyone who was doing something meaningful to them that also was enduring conditions of chronic stress and demands could be burned out. So to that end, they went ahead and they did some research. And lo and behold, they did find that parents too can get burned out. And so what is it? What does that mean, right? So generally speaking here's what the data have suggested um, not to nerd out or anything but i am a little bit of a nerd um so sorry <laughs> so there's four main components of it okay so the very first one is feeling exhausted by the parental role and we've seen a lot of memes about this lately and you know this is something that almost definitely is exacerbated by the COVID crisis. So feeling exhausted, unable, overwhelmed to take care of basic parenting tasks um, in day-to-day -day life. That's the first part of it. The second part of it is feeling like there's some contrast with the parent you were, feeling no longer your best, seeing that huge contrast that me now is not what I was then. I'm not as confident. I'm not as skilled. I'm more overwhelmed. I'm not as happy or fulfilled in my role as I once was then. So there's this distinction between your role now and your role then. Um, there's also the third part of this is feeling really fed up with the parental role. And I think we've probably all have been there. I'm a parent too. Um, my kids are older. I have a 20 year old and a 15 year old. Um, but I think we've probably all felt frustrated at one point or another with the tasks of parenting right? This is that on steroids. So this is a much deeper and more intense experience of that frustration. And then the last part is emotional distancing from one's children. So feeling distant, disconnected, um, not necessarily a numbness, but just feeling disconnected and feeling sort of a lull of emotion about kids. So is it different from job burnout? 
Yeah, it's different because it's contextual. It's something, it's something that's very specific to the parenting context and specific to parenting tasks. Um, somebody asked the question about, can you have both of these at the same time? And, you know, they are correlated. There's a small to moderate relationship, which means that if you have one, you also might be feeling overwhelmed in another context. And of course, that makes sense because what burnout is, is sort of a response that you're having to dealing with conditions of chronic stress that are beyond your capacity to cope. Okay, so if you are feeling that in one area, it doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility that you're also feeling that in other areas of your life. There are some differences though, right, between, in addition to just that they're contextually different. And one is that parent burnout is really linked to some other, um, other outcomes. You know, we'll talk about the risk factors. Actually, I'll talk about the risk factors first before I talk about the outcomes. How about that? So you know kind of like who's at risk for this? And there's actually some really nice recent work on this. A lot of these studies are not in the U.S. Some of them are. Some of them are in other countries. But they seem to be relevant to our discussion today. So um, <clears throat> when we say risk factors, this doesn't mean that if you have this thing, you will become burned out. That's what we call a causal relationship. And as you know, correlation or causation doesn't mean, um, or correlation doesn't mean causation. Just because two things co-occur doesn't mean that one causes the other, okay? So here are risk factors. One is holding yourself to unreasonable standards or trying to be a perfect parent to get everything right all the time. So newsflash, none of us ever do, no matter how we hard we try. And I've written books on parenting and one of my favorite stories is when I was writing my first one, which came out in 2009, is upstairs writing my parenting book and my kids were much, much younger and they were downstairs and I think one was, one was four and the other one was probably nine and they were yelling and fighting and you know scream bloody murder at each other and i'm upstairs trying to write a book about how to advise parents as an expert and i was like shut up i'm trying to write the parenting book yeah not one of my finer moments but you get the idea so no one's perfect parent and trying to hold yourself to that standard is a risk factor for getting burnt out all right number two so this is another one that's important. If you're, if, you know, there's a lot of variability in, you know, how we are, our temperaments, put it that way, right? And some of us are more adventurous, some of us are more shy, some of us are more uninhibited and we love to go and do things and be gregarious and be social and others of us are more reserved, okay? Some of us are on the more anxious side whether that's a clinically significant anxiety or whether that's sort of a, just part of you know, how you're built. So that can be, to the degree that you are experiencing anxiety, that can be a predictor right, of parental burnout. Also, your ability to manage stress, right? Your sense of self-efficacy, your emotion agility, and we'll talk about that and psychological flexibility in, in a little bit. Those are also predictors of whether you will or whether you will not experience parenting burnout. Third thing, risk factor. If you are a single parent or if you do not have support from a co-parent, okay? emotional support from a co-parent, if you feel like you have to shoulder the burden all by yourself, that's going to be a risk factor. Um, folks who are not who don't have great support or skill in actual child rearing practices. So having good skills about how do you manage behavior, how do you pick your battles and all of those things. And we can talk about some basics um, in a little bit of those too. So I can actually give you some of these webinar that may be useful to you. If you are raising a child with a chronic um, health condition, um, a mental health condition, or uh, 
you know, any kind of special needs, that can also be a contributing factor because the demands are much greater on you as a parent. You may need to have an extra skill set. You may need to spend more time working with your kids. Um, and that is going to push other things to the margins of your life, including your own self-care. So that's another risk factor. And then finally, parents who are working from home. And that is these days, most of us, right? Unless you are an essential worker, then you have the added burden of, you know, the anxiety about going in and out of your house um, and caring for your children as well. Okay, but of course this data that I'm talking about, we don't have data from the COVID crisis on what our risk factors for parental burnout. That may be on the way, um, as a number of researchers are actually looking at interventions for parenting. I was just consulting on um, a project with Dr. Jill Ehrenreich May from the University of Miami this morning and the last few days, and they are developing a really lovely parenting protocol using the Unified Protocol. Um, which is an approach to, it's sort of an acceptance-based approach for anxiety and depression. And so they're working on extending, for kids, but they're working on extending this out to parents. So that was really exciting to see that. Um, so that data, those data are coming, but for right now, this is what we have um, to guide us in this time. And so we'll have to make the most of that until we have more news coming in. So what are the consequences that are associated with par parental burnout, right? And this is the part where we were talking about these things are associated, but they're not necessarily caused you know, by parent burnout, but they are, parent burnout does increase risk for these things. Um, <clears throat> one is depression. So when you're feeling overwhelmed, when stress has taken over, you're more likely to have a lower mood. You are more likely to have um, some issues with addiction, so increased consumption of alcohol, etc., addictive behaviors, you can see an increase sometimes. Sleep disruption, which I think is a common sense sort of thing that you would expect to be associated in condi with conditions of increased stress. Couples conflict is another one that we tend to see. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're experiencing burnout, you're more likely to have more conflictual interactions with your partner. And then there are three variables that had sort of a pretty strong relationship with this that we need to really watch out for. One is the idea of escaping, opting out, and increased thoughts of suicide. So that is something that um, was four times more likely to, you know, be associated with this than with job burnout. So that's something to be aware of. The second thing, 10 times more associated with parental burnout than with job burnout, was child neglect. So opting out, not taking care of the basic needs, okay? And then the last one is parental violence. We all lose our tempers, but the risk for really losing your temper in a way that is harmful is <clears throat> much higher in the face of parental burnout. And for all of these reasons, it's really important to kind of, let's think about this together. What can we do? Because under this, um, the conditions of COVID, everybody is at increased risk for higher stress which means people are more at risk if you are a parent for parental burnout. Okay, let me take a sip here because I'm losing my voice. I'm okay, but I'm just letting you know. <coughs> All right. So next steps, what do we do about all of this? What does recovery look like was the question. I don't have an answer for you. There aren't any real data on recovery for parent burnout. However, for the things that are risk factors, for dealing with increased stress, and for some of the parenting issues that arise, we do have answers for those. 
Okay, so I'm going to go through and I'm going to see if I can give you some really practical tips um, for things that you can do if you're feeling overwhelmed. All right, and I hope these are useful to you. And I know Scott's keeping tabs on the questions and things like that. So Scott, if there's anything that comes in that you want to stop me for and ask a question, feel free to do that. Okay, I'm going to keep rolling other than that. Great, thank you. Okay, so the first thing is, if you are a parent out there, start where you are, okay? Take a second, take stock, and just let yourself acknowledge how hard this all is, okay? I don't know about you all, but certainly, you know, we're all, all of us who are in the mental health community are kind of talking together, and we're noticing it seems to be coming in waves. You know, when some days or weeks are better than others, there seems to be some sort of progression where you fall into routines. And then other times the enormity of it all sort of is overwhelming, especially as we consider sort of the very fractured um, responses, that, you know, in terms of the infrastructure of the government for handling all of this. It's just so different across so many different locations. People have such mixed feelings. And while we are all this, all in this together, it is affecting us differentially. And so I was just yesterday in a meeting of scientists from the National Academy of Science discussing how could we support families? What do we need to do to help families create nurturing environments in the face of COVID? And it's really important to acknowledge that communities that are living in poverty and communities of color are experiencing more significant consequences of the COVID crisis than those of us who are not in those communities, okay? So yes, we are all in this together. And also it's important to kind of know there are differential effects. So for parents, start where you are. Give yourself some space and time to just kind of check in with yourself and see how it is that you're feeling. And by the way, I apologize, you are gonna hear dogs barking through this. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, the second thing I'm gonna say is let yourself off the hook. I know one of the things that we know is a risk factor for um, parent burnout is trying to be a perfect parent. There is no such thing. And trying to hold yourself to those standards is going to contribute to that. So the first thing is let yourself off the hook. Pick your battles. And it's not that you have to reduce your expectations of yourself or your children, but it does make sense to shift them, okay? The world has absolutely shifted on its axis around us, all of us, our whole context in which we engage in all of these parenting behaviors and raising our families and caring for them has changed. There is no way we can keep going at the same pace and in the same way that we have. All the demands have shifted. Give yourself some time to just acknowledge that and think about what is workable for you in your house, with your family, with your children, in your context, okay? And go from there. Take care of the basics first, okay? Basic needs and then see what energy you have left over, okay? Make sure self-care is a part of that. And we've been um, writing a lot, doing a lot of other webinars and things like that on parent self-care. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> the third thing I would suggest, and this is really, they're all important, but this one's especially important. Um, create your own self bubble or your own safe harbor. And what I mean by that is create a support group of peers, of friends, of your family, who can be around you. No one should do this alone. So if you can do that, that's helpful. If you feel isolated, please know that McLean has a number of webinars that are available. Other agencies have many, there's so many of us doing these talks. Division 53 of the American Psychological Association has put out several. Um, there's Praxis is another um, site where they're putting out free webinars on how can you cope with this, okay? So there are resources available. 
The other reason to do that, to create a safe harbor for yourself that is made up of your peers and friends and things like that, is that you're not alone in how you're feeling. You're not alone in the overwhelm. And reaching out will give you some more evidence that you're not, and there's strength in numbers. In addition, it's if you are isolated, that's gonna increase your risk for things, right? Um, of feeling vulnerable, of losing your temper, things like that. So it's really, really important to make sure you're surrounded by people, okay, who can help. Number four, okay, stop and breathe if you can. So, and we're gonna talk about some really practical ways to do this, but in general, the principle is you need downtime. You have to give yourself some downtime whether that's finding some space at the end of the night when everybody else has gone to bed, whether that's enforcing a, a break, and we'll talk exactly about how you might do that with younger children, um, especially because that's gonna be the hardest, I think. You know, finding some time for just yourself to stop and breathe and check in with yourself and see how you're doing during the time, um, during a few windows of your day. That's gonna be essential. It's good if you can take breaks, get outside, take a walk, move your body. So first medicine is always gonna be things like caring for your body, making sure you get enough sleep, exercise, right? And consider what you're taking in. Consider limiting things like nicotine, smoking, anything else like that, alcohol, substances. Think about eating healthy things, okay? Um, those are all things that are going to help shore up your resolve and your reserve energy. Okay, step five. One thing that I think might be really, really helpful is practicing mindfulness and mindful awareness of where you're at and acceptance. So this is hard for all of us, but it gets harder the more we try to kind of ignore that reality, push it away, minimize it, right? We have a habit as a culture to think that, you know, the less anxiety, depression, et cetera, that you feel, the more healthy you are. And so if we get attached to sort of strategies to try and manage how we feel by dismissing it or avoiding it, that can be counterproductive and it can use up a lot of your energy and your bandwidth, right? I think we talked about this last time, but like it's kind of like trying to push a beach ball into water, right? And the more you push it down, the more it's gonna pop up. The more you push it down, the more it's gonna pop up, okay? So one thing that you can really do is slow down if you take these breaks that I'm suggesting before and see if you can just slow yourself down Bring your awareness really gently to how you are. Check in with yourself. Notice how your body feels. You can also, if that's uncomfortable for you, notice the world around you using your five senses. For some of us who are anxious, right? Noticing what's going on in your body can be triggering. So for those of you who have that going on, ground yourself by noticing things around you. Look for things that are unfamiliar or beautiful or unexpected, okay? And just even if you do this during daily activities, right? Taking a walk, washing the dishes, getting dressed, you know, taking a shower, going to bed, tidying the house, whatever it is. Even if you practice just bringing your awareness or paying attention on purpose to your surroundings, that can be helpful, okay? The other thing that I find helpful personally and that I teach is mindful awareness of what you're thinking and what you're feeling, right? See if you can kind of slow yourself down and really notice what is it that is hard? What am I thinking about? You know? Sometimes we won't know. Sometimes you'll just walk around feeling super stressed out and like you're reacting to things and you won't really know. That's a cue to slow down and pay attention and just notice. See if you can observe your emotions. 
see if you can label them for what they are and see if you can soften yourself around them with them gently. Okay. One thing that's really important is, you know, you may feel like a parent, especially since we've sort of talked about managing, um, you know, or feeling burned out as leading to losing your temper, right? Here's the thing. There's a distinction between feeling things like anger and what you do in the context of that anger. It is 100% okay to feel whatever you're feeling and to think whatever you're thinking, okay? We tend to beat ourselves up when we think we have thoughts that are unacceptable. And I know this very well working with OCD, but I also know this well as a parent right? If you lose your temper, you might feel shame. You might be beating yourself up for that, etc. So those are not necessarily, those are very normal responses, but they're not necessarily helpful ones. Okay. So another thing you can let yourself off the hook for is whatever you're thinking and feeling. You're not in charge of that. You are, however, in charge of what you choose to do in the context of those emotions. Very important distinction, okay? It's okay to feel angry, not okay to engage in violence. That would be the obvious one, okay? But you get the idea. Okay, sixth strategy. <clears throat> this one may be helpful as well. So we talked a little bit in number five about being aware and noticing being aware of and noticing your emotions. So there's also stepping back from your thoughts. Okay, what does that mean? All right, so I'm just gonna show you something and I, I actually don't have a pen here, so what I think I'm gonna do is just, we'll do this. So I want you to imagine, think for a second, we'll do a little exercise together just to give you an idea of how this works. Okay, and I'm gonna try and do, I've not done this via Zoom before, so you guys are gonna be my guinea pigs. We'll give it a shot. <clears throat> and this is an exercise from Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, okay, which is one of the therapies that I work with and teach and use, right? So I want you to call to mind just for a second a thought that you have that you find unacceptable or unwanted. Pro you know, something like a, a negative critical thought something like that okay and here's the metaphor when you have that thought if you're trying to get rid of it it can be so let's just say we'll just use this right when you're trying to get rid of that thought it can be like it captures your whole awareness right it's up close to you and the more you try to push it away the more present it is for you the more it takes up all of your bandwidth, right? So what if you could have that thought but from a distance? Okay, and just notice what it looks like on the screen, okay? So this thought is further, it's close to me because I'm holding it close to me, but it's further away from you, all right? You can notice the thought, but you can also notice whatever else is going on around me in the screen and it works kind of like that so really simple exercise that you can practice when you're having thoughts like i'm so mad at my kiddo for x or why is he so disrespectful or i can't believe i had that thought i'm a terrible parent you can slow yourself down and simply notice the process of your thinking just notice i am having the thought that i am a terrible parent I am having the thought that I am feeling overwhelmed. I am having the thought that I want to opt out. Okay. And so as you practice this, and I know it sounds silly and I know it's just a small thing. What I'd encourage you to do is practice it and see what happens. Okay. Sometimes it can help increase the distinction between you, the thinker and the thoughts that you're having. And it doesn't make the thoughts go away because, again, we're not in charge of our thoughts and our feelings, right? But we, we can step back from them and we can hold them more lightly. And you can certainly change your relationship to them. So a good example of this, you know, 
I have thoughts all the time about giving talks like this. I have a lot of social anxiety, um, just true fact. Um, you know, and it's something that pops up and goes away throughout the course of my life. And so what I've learned to do through using this approach is to notice, wow, I'm having lots of thoughts about how terrible this talk is going. And oh my gosh, Scott must hate this webinar, <laughs> etc. And that's okay. Maybe or maybe not. But I can choose my intention, right? I can choose to manage those thoughts or I can try and do my best to teach you well what I know. And so that's what I'm going to try and focus on. And you guys will get the feedback. So we won't know how this will all play out until we get it. But that's an example. You can use this as well with parenting, okay? And that's going to be um, something. We'll talk about that one in a minute. All right, number seven. This is one of my favorite tools that you can use if you're feeling burned out. And that is slow down, take a moment, and simply ask yourself, what is it that you need right now? And as a matter of fact, let's do that. Just take a few seconds. Take a nice deep breath or two. And just check in with yourself. What is it that you need right now? If you need to shift in your chair to make yourself 10% more comfortable. Do you need a drink of water? Is there someone you're worried about that you would like to call or message? Do you need to close your eyes for a minute because you're tired? Do you need to get outside in the sun? And simply slowing down, checking in, and see if you can engage and give yourself one small act of kindness. It's very simple. Just check in. How are you doing? And can you give yourself what you need right now? Now, for some of us, that's a really hard thing to do. Because our minds might chime in, especially if we've done something that we aren't proud of in parenting. We feel like we failed at something. Or we haven't done a good job at something. Our minds might pop in and say, Psh, you don't deserve that, you don't deserve kindness, or that's silly, that touchy-feely stuff, you know. I've had both of those thoughts, I, maybe you have too. And so here's the thing to remember. Notice that you are having that thought, okay? Notice how you're speaking to yourself, and ask yourself this, if you have that critical voice in your mind, like many of us do, would you tolerate a friend? treating you like that or speaking to you that way? Isn't it interesting that we would set limits with that friend or person speaking to us that way? And yet this goes on a lot in our minds and we don't, um, and we do allow it, right? So if you do notice that critical voice, see if you can speak to yourself kindly as well. And if it says you don't deserve that, see if you can step back, notice that thought with some detachment, and do the kind thing anyway. Okay. This last one is one of my favorites. In this last one, we call it pause, notice, and choose your intention. Okay? And it's a really simple thing. If you find yourself, you know, in a conflictual situation, difficult, challenging interaction with one of your kids or with your partner. Pause. Get curious about what's going on. What are you up to in that moment? You may notice that what you're working on is just trying to get rid of whatever this yucky situation is that's happening. You may feel a sense of struggle. If you notice that, step back. And if that's not helpful, see if you can choose a different intention, right? Your intention can be something that matters to you. For example, you might think about, you know, what do I want my kids to remember about this? 
experience five years from now, 10 years from now? How do I want to remember myself in this moment five years or 10 years from now? Right? You might choose something different because if you're working on getting rid of a negative thought or feeling, that's going to take up all your bandwidth, just like this. Okay? Step back from the thought, notice it, allow it, and pick a different battle. Maybe you want to walk away, maybe you want to take a break, maybe you want to wait before speaking, maybe that's consistent with um, being more effective for you. Maybe you want to engage on a small act of self-kindness. So pause, notice what you're up to. And if you find yourself in an unworkable struggle, choose a different intention. Okay. All right. So we have a number of other questions. I'm going to try and get through most of these if I can. One of them is how can a parent work play, care at home all in the same day and keep themselves from burning out during this time. And I thought about that one and the first thing that came to mind is, I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. I think that we're probably all at risk for parent burnout. I do think, however, using the steps, and I'll go over them again, just I'll name them, that I've outlined for you are going to be really helpful. Start where you are. Notice what's hard, let yourself off the hook, shift your expectations, don't lower them necessarily, but certainly shift them. Create your own self-harbor by creating a group of supporters that can help you and seeking resources that are in the community. There's a lot of stuff online. Taking breaks, stopping and breathing. That's the next one. Practicing mindful awareness and acceptance, especially when things are hard but just as well throughout the day, just as a practice. Um, that will help you shift your perspective. Stepping back from your thoughts, noticing them as thoughts and not necessarily things that you need to respond to. Checking in with yourself to see what you need right now and engaging in self-compassion when you can. And then finally, pause, notice, choose your intention. What is your intention? In your actions okay so if you use all of those ingredients that's going to support something that we call psychological flexibility and really simply put what that means is choosing to do what matters to you whether or not you're experiencing strong emotions and taking a step towards that when it really matters right so it's not about reducing anxiety and depression. We're gonna assume that those are gonna go up and down, right? It's about when you're experiencing stress, when you are experiencing those things, stepping back, noticing your thoughts and emotions, and choosing to take step towards what matters most to you in those moments. The other name for that is, um, which was coined by Susan David, who's uh, you know another Harvard professor, is emotional agility, right? So it's not about regulating, dismissing, dampening down your emotions. It's about learning how to behave in the context of emotions flexibly and effectively, okay? In a way that's less effortful than trying to struggle with them and push them to the side. So those are the skills that underlie those are the steps that underlie psychological flexibility. Okay, so other good, great questions from folks. One is, what do you suggest for break time that parents and kids can take part in together that isn't necessarily an electronic device? That's a great question, actually. Um, and I think it's really hard for us because one of the hardest things is that it seems like devices are the break of choice for our kids, whereas they may not be for us. So um, there's a great group that I want to um, share with you. It's called the Center for Humane Technology. Um, and if you Google Center for Humane Technology, it's a nonprofit in California, but they're committed to exactly what the title of their organization is, Humane Tech. And they just put out some really nice guidelines 
for what parents can do about screens and screen use during COVID. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, so other things to do, I would say get outside, change the scene, right? Sometimes just shifting perspective by changing where you are can be helpful. So if you can get outside on a sunny day, take a drive on a day that isn't sunny, right? Um, do engage in social distancing. It's still very, very important. COVID is still here. The risk of it has not decreased. We, have, we are starting to see some declines in the rates of infection but we still need to maintain our social distance and guidelines um, in order to keep ourselves safe. But still, if you can get out, do fun things outside, do scavenger hunts with things that are colorful or with things that you haven't seen, different kinds of birds. Go out and listen to different kinds of bird calls. The Audubon Society has um, an app and a website that will help you identify birds, bring kids closer to nature, find different plants. You can come up with all sorts of things like that. So, so other things that are more, yeah, Scott. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, um, go for it. And apologies to everyone. I was going to be on video today and for some reason I can't get it to start. So next time, lesson learned. Um, we have, <laughs> we've had a tremendous amount of really great feedback during this. And oh, lot, good. You no, know, tons of good topics. But more importantly, people have um, lots of really great questions for you. So oh, okay. I have, I have a couple I'd like you to answer, especially because these folks are watching. You got it. Um, if you could just spend a second talking about helping younger children deal with the stress of being home, being cooped up, and not even, you know, especially seeing friends. And yes. And asking specifically about very young children, you know, kids that are used to going to the playground, going to friends' houses, being really social, and now all of a sudden they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So now we have to get creative and... That's one of my very favorite age groups to work with because I used to do consulting for Head Starts for about a really long time, maybe like 15, 16 years before coming to McLean. Um, and I also worked in early intervention before that. So with the zero to three and three to five set, and they are my little favorites. Um, okay, couple of things. How do you help them? Um, and I wanna talk more broadly um, too, because this was one of the questions that other folks, I suppose, had sent from, you know, other webinars. How do you deal with little kid emotions about all of this stuff? And so I'm going to give you some steps, okay, that are really concrete for things that you can do. One is empathize, okay? I see how you are feeling. You look like you are very sad right now. You look really mad, okay? So instead of reacting, first meet them where they are. And if they are little, they are going to, this happens to young children and also teenagers. In the middle, we see sort of a leveling out of this. But you'll notice that with little guys, when they feel emotions, it's like they've always felt this emotion. It's the worst thing ever, and it's never going to stop. So if you have young kids, you know what I'm talking about. That goes away. And then when we have our adolescent brain changes happening, it seems to come back only in much bigger form. <laughs> so it's all big emotions in adolescence too. So first, empathize. See the emotion, label it. Two, this is a neat trick from a great book called How to Talk So Your Kids Can Listen and How to Listen So Your Kids Can Talk. It's an old, old classic, an oldie but a goodie. Grant them their wish and imagination. So if it's, I really want to go play with my friends, mom, why can't I go? I wish you could too. I could wish you there. I would do it. And I would have you playing in a dollhouse or doing whatever it is that's fun. Okay. Grant them their wish and imagination. Two, help them, or three, help them label their emotions. Okay. That is what's going on between the ages of um, three to five. Kids are burgeoning you know, social and emotional competence. They usually have that ability shaped when interacting with similar peers, but they are looking to you as parents for how do I, what do I do with my emotions, okay? So your job as a parent isn't necessarily to manage emotions. More you can, if it's possible, so with little guys, check the basics. Are they hungry? Do they have sleep? All of those things, especially with very young children. Check the basics first. And if you can help the situation, great. Are they overstimulated? Are they understimulated and bored, right? 
if you can change contextual things, go for it. But if not, help them learn to label their emotions, help them notice that emotions are impermanent, that they come and they go. So I used to have this kind of conversation. So are you smiling now? Huh, that's amazing. You just told me you were going to be mad at me forever. Wow, that's cool. Did you notice that? Right, so call their attention to when things shift and change. That will require you to attend to that. Make a space for them to feel their emotions. Teach them that they can behave differently. You know, they can choose how to behave even if they're feeling an emotion. And as you know, with young kids, that's not a skill they have in place yet. And it's also one that some adults, even us, we don't have in place all the time either, especially when we're experiencing really intense emotions. But the number one thing, remember this, is to model for them. Model what to do. In other words, they learn not from what you say, but from what you do. And there's tons of data on that. Little kids learn from watching consequences. So here's one thing you can practice. You're in the car, it's traffic. There's not much traffic these days, but you get the idea. You're frustrated, you can model. Ah, oh, I'm so mad, I'm in traffic. I just wanna step on the gas. You know what? I'm gonna take a deep breath and I'm not gonna do that, but I'm still mad. Just like that. You can have an emotion and you don't have to react to it. So those are some tips for what you can do with little kids. Other than that, we have to get very creative. Have them make things for their friends if they can't see them. Make them cards, go deliver the cards. You can do that. Um, you know, and come up with other kinds of activities. And little kids, I, lots of parents are doing sort of online FaceTime, you know, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, sorts of calls with friends, um, play dates, other things that, you know, even myself and my friend group have done. We would make a date where we're all gonna, we pass around a recipe and we all make the same thing in our separate houses and the kids are all running around in the back. Um, and my, our friends have some younger kids too. So our kids are older, but still, right? So there are very creative things that you can do to kind of engage with your community. Um, so those are some of them. Scott, other questions? Yes, a couple more. Okay. Um, before people start jumping off, I know some people have to go at one. I did want to mention a couple of uh, quick things. Yeah, and there's one thing I wanted to give to parents too really quick too, before you ask those. Yeah. So this came up in the questions that I had. How do I get a break? How do I help kids understand that I really need a break as a parent? So here's my suggestion for that. Use what we call a contingency statement. If you do this, then you can have that, okay? And say, mommy needs 15 minutes or however long, right? That's appropriate given your child and their developmental circumstances. I need you to play in your room, read, watch a screen, whatever you choose in your family that works for you. And at the end of 15 minutes, I can, I'll come get you or you can come get me. But, and then we can do something fun. But if you interrupt me before then, the timer's gonna start over. Okay, so it's a really simple behavior management tool where you're defining what do I want you to do? If you do that thing, you will earn X, right? And the contingency for if you do not do that thing. If you do not do that thing, the timer's gonna start over and we're gonna have to go longer, I'm sorry, okay? And if you think your child can't do it for a really long time, if 15 minutes is too long, start shaping it for two minutes right? It depends. Start where you are with your little ones. Plan well, depending on their age. Make sure they have really fun, engaging things to do, okay? If there are safety issues, right? If you can't leave them unsupervised, which many of us can't if they're younger kids, make sure they are line of sight, but you have some space, okay? So remember, contingency statement. If then you do, you earn. Here's the rule, I want you to do this. Here's the contingency. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. And last thing, don't say that if you're not going to follow through. Because remember, kids learn from what we do, not what we say, okay? All right, Scott, go ahead. 
All right. Um, what I, we did want to say is that uh, lots of people are loving this, and they want essentially a okay. list of everything you've recommended so far. Okay. So I'm going to try and work with you later tonight. Okay. Put together um, a list. People are also asking. We can do this again. <laughs> Oh, I, anyway, I'm go hoping, ahead. I'm hoping we will, but yeah, I want to get it all down. I think people are writing as furiously as I am right okay. now. So I promise everyone we will get you that list. Um, people are also asking about a list of resources for parents. So mm. I'm thinking we should probably just put one together and that can include some of the webinars that we've done. Happy to do that. I just did that for my community too. Um, and that's, I'm happy to do that. All right, perfect. So we'll be able to push that out. Um, two quick things that I'm hoping we can cover. Um, could you just take a second to speak about um, the need for physical affection from parents during this time as, um, you know, children are not out there and they're not playing and they're not around their friends and, you know, children tend to be affectionate and sometimes parents are less so. So would you speak, be able to speak that just for a moment and see you know, whether or not it's important or not? And if, if not, or, if, or let's put it this way, if parents do struggle with it, mm -hmm. what do you recommend that they do to kind of get over that hump? Well, I think the first thing is to, um, kids will let you know what they need if you really are connected with them. And the best way to get reconnected with them, because you remember that emo feeling emotionally distant is a sign of parental burnout, okay? So if I could suggest a first step, I would say practicing your mindful awareness when you're with this little person, okay? So many times when we're with other people, we're formulating what we want to say next, or we're thinking some thought, or we're struggling with some other thing in our mind, and we're not really with the other person. My very favorite time, and a really powerful, evocative you know, time to practice mindful awareness, is when you are with someone that you care about. So try this, right? Check in, talk with them, and if you notice your mind is drifting or racing or you're trying to figure out, do they want affection? Do they not want affection? Bring your attention simply to them and just kind of watch them kind of like you're watching a sunset. You know, when you're watching a sunset, you're not trying to figure it out. You're not trying to think about the next right thing. You're simply appreciating it, letting it wash over you. Bring that quality to your interactions with your kids. And they will let you know when and if they need affection. And then you can go from there. And who knows, if you're feeling a little bit emotionally numbed out, that might, it just might help you reconnect. Okay, so I'll leave you with that. Lisa, can I ask you to come back very soon and do one session ju just on teens? Um, yeah, yeah. Even folks that have seen your past webinars are asking for more help regarding- uh, 100%. Yeah, people are, are definitely having a tough time and I understand why. I mean, they're yes. not that long ago we were that age. And, we uh, talk, we and talk about that in our new book. Yep. And this is the chapter for parents of teens. <laughs> it's actually for teenagers to give to their parents. So yes, I would be very happy to do that. Excellent. Um, so yeah, like I said, we got a lot of people asking about it, but I think we're going to have to do another session. Um, anyone who's interested in this, you're on, if you signed up for this webinar, you are on our email list, so you will continue to get invitations. If you don't get invitations, um, i trying to think if I should, I'll tell you what, um, email me directly and I will make sure that you get them. It's S-O-B-R-I-E-N-1-2- Actually, I'll tell you what, I'll put it in Why chat. don't you type it in the chat? Yeah, I'm forgetting that people can see it. It's our first webinar <laughs> Q&A. I'm not used to being able to just share things like this. Um, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm on Zoom every day, all day. <laughs> we'll teach you, Scott. It's okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll focus on the teens. We'll get people that list. Let me see. Um, yeah, I think we're going to be able to, to do most of these things. Again, thank you so much for all of the ideas. Um, my hand is actually sore from the amount of writing I've done. I'm not even joking um, over the last hour. Um, so yeah, we're going to wrap up with Lisa right now. But if you want to keep sending over questions, I'll stay on here for a little while longer. I'm trying to reply as quickly as I can to everybody. So Thank um, you folks for coming. We're, we're happy to try and be a resource to you all. Um, and so from McLean and all of us to you, 
take care of yourselves and stay safe. And we'll be back. <laughs>